We read a story on the internet, it was the Modesto Bee on Wednesday night, saying that there was a farm with 50,000 hens that were left to starve to death. And then we read that state officials were called in to start killing them, killing those that were, had survived this ordeal, and we immediately jumped into action to try to help. that they were birds who were still alive and, and it would just be the worst thing that we could ever do to turn our backs on those birds. the poultry owner, there was an excuse given of a lack of communication with the people he had hired to feed them. But he also said that he had ran out of money. So who knows where the truth lies. What we do know is that those birds were not given food for well over two weeks. I got a call from Margie, our education manager, and she said that she had just heard about the situation that this farm had gone under, the guy had stopped feeding his birds, and there was 50,000 hens in this facility a few hours away that had been starving to death. We called David at Rescue Ranch and Keegan in at Rescue Ranch. They drove down to see if there was any more information that could be gathered on site. Well, we called Harvest Home that same afternoon to see if they had any information about it and if they could go over there and, and try to investigate further so we could find out more. We get there, the vet has estimated that about a third of the birds have starved to death already. So what's that, 17, 18,000 birds are dead in their cages being stepped on by other chickens. Their whole life they have lived in a cage. All that they have known is wire flooring. You know, they've never touched the earth. They've never seen the sun. They've never been able to move more than six or eight inches in any direction, and they still bump into other birds. I mean, they can't spread their wings, and that's their whole existence for, for two years before they're killed. You know, we were parked on the road directly in front of these sheds, and you could smell the ammonia coming out of the sheds just from the accumulation of feces. On top of that, you could smell the beginnings of decay of these birds that had been trapped in these cages for over two weeks without food. Surprisingly, there was resistance from the Stanislaus County Animal Control to release any of the animals to us. We had known from that night that they had been taking birds and, and gassing them and filling dump trucks full and taking them out. And we knew that they were going to start again at some point in the morning. We didn't know when, so we wanted to catch them as soon as we possibly could. Inside of these two buildings, there was just such an immense amount of suffering and knowing that, you know, in order to have our, our best chances of rescuing as many animals as possible that we had to, you know, lay low and, and wait for permission to, to rescue the animals it was tough. following morning, uh, the entire staff and another stock trailer headed down to the site. I think for the local animal control agency dealing with this case, they had never seen such a large-scale uh, 
rescue before. They had never seen such massive cruelty and they had no idea what to do. They resisted any kind of pressure from um, people who were caring about the welfare of these birds um, for that reason alone. So after animal control has, has kicked us off the property a couple of times at this point, uh, cops have come and gone. It was very apparent initially that they were not gonna let us near, near those birds. We watched as they were pulling birds out of the barn and we watched as they were gassing them at the ends of the barn and we were there and, and it was so frustrating to know that we had all these trailers, all these volunteers and all these places that were willing to take these birds in and they were still killing them. State officials originally were using the kind of gas chambers that egg farms use which are just these big metal bins and they fit about 100 to 150 hens and the way they kill these birds they just throw literally a hundred hens who are fully conscious and alive into these bins and so most of them at the bottom smother to death. It's just a miserable, miserable way to die. At some point I guess they either ran out of the tanks or the boxes weren't working as well or as quickly as they wanted them to. The solution of the state officials was to use garbage bins, just big plastic garbage bins and they would throw in 50 hens and then close the top and funnel in. Um, they would connect it to the carbon dioxide gas chamber and that is how they would kill them. And it was to me so iconic of how the industry and of how I think people in general see chickens. They're, they're trash and that's how they were being treated and that's how they were being killed. You've got sheds full of prisoners, sheds full of individuals in cages that are there to, to work and produce and they're only as valuable as their productivity and then when they become a problem you put them in a canister and you gas them. What else does that sound like? They were just literally throwing the dead bodies into a front loader then they would take that and they would dump all those bodies and just hundreds of them into the back of kind of like a gravel truck. Literally dump trucks full of, of dead birds you know leaving to go to these landfills. To see them treated in such a, a horrific way, a way you would never, ever dream of treating a dog or a cat, uh, is just heartbreaking. Not knowing whether or not they're actually gonna let us go in and help was, was infuriating. They were so close, and at the time, we weren't sure that we were gonna get anyone out of there. So, you know, they're murdering live beings that have just been through hell. And, and they're saying, no, you can't do anything about it. That's not an option for a compassionate person. There was a plan B when, when we realized that there was a good chance that they were not gonna release animals to us. And the plan B, it was the staff, we all came together, sat down and uh, called our attorney. We were very close to just going in and trying to save one into however many we can get before we were you know, detained by the police. It got to the point where you know, we suited up, we put on our, you know, biosafety gear and, and got ready. If we had to walk into those sheds ourselves and start pulling birds and they'd have to physically stop us. We were gonna disobey the orders of animal control, of the vet and of the, the police that were there and we were going to take our carriers and go into these sheds to rescue birds because what else can we do? There was just this resolve that we were gonna save as many chickens as we could. Just that's all there was to it. And there were enough people there that were ready to go in right then and there and just, you know, fight through the crowds or the, or the police line or whatever just to get in there. You may not necessarily succeed, but you have to try. You know, morality dictates that you have to try. To let them just be ripped out of the cages and gassed, when you know you can save their lives, you have a moral mandate to do so. There was an incredible energy about no one was leaving. No one was going to like walk away. It just, it just wasn't going to happen. Absolutely, people would be ready to be arrested. I mean, who wouldn't? News crews had showed up. You know, they were there filming, so we knew that you know at least word of this you know atrocity would would spread. Sort of right then, uh, the director for Stanislaus Animal Control showed up. Kim was able to you know sort of pin her in front of the camera and say, "Listen, you know, we're here to help." Um, are you gonna let us in? And with three television news cameras in her face, I think she sort of felt like she had no other option but to say, okay. When we were finally given custody of the hens, it was just this incredible feeling of joy. Uh, we were gonna be able to help. We were gonna be able to save so many lives um, and kind of make a triumph out of tragedy. The County Animal Control Agency finally gave us custody because Animal Place, 
Harvest Home Animal Sanctuary and all of our supporters wouldn't back down. We were not going to take no for an answer. Um, these hens had no advocates. They were being killed en masse, and we were the only ones who were there to stand up and be a voice for these hens. We weren't allowed inside the sheds, so it was state officials who were gathering all the hens they deemed were um, savable. What had happened inside of those sheds was so grotesque and awful that they didn't want anybody in there to see it. There were a lot of people there, all with the same intent of saving as many lives as we could. Everybody just pitched in and it was just amazing to see everybody helping in any way that they could. It was like everyone kind of just knew what they had to do and we just all went into just emergency mode. It happened so quickly, but we had 800 loaded into our trailer within what, like an hour, two hours, and we rushed them back to the sanctuary, Rescue Ranch. We are so grateful that we have this other facility, Rescue Ranch, which essentially lays dormant for those big rescues so that we can take in a large number. Got back to the sanctuary, you know, three hours later and worked until I don't know, three o'clock in the morning. You know, we're triaging them. There's hens who need special fluids and feeds, and we had this special room set up for the sickest of the sick. They were weak, they were emaciated, they were, you know, 70% under body weight. Uh, most of these hens, of course, were really at death's door. They had been without food for over two weeks. And the tragic part about rescuing hens from battery cage operations is that they've lived in such strict confinement that they have no idea how to deal with freedom. All they've known is being around other birds and, and not being able to move. And so they just clump and they clump on top of each other. And you have to go around and you have to unclump them. And, and I remember all of us probably got to bed about one or two o'clock in the morning and we only had about two or three hours of sleep because we had to get up and go back to the farm the next day. And I was the first one up the second morning and I trudged up to the barn and you know, there were about 30 hens who hadn't made it. They had just been smothered and I was unclumping them. And um, there was just this one hen who was still alive and she was dying, you know, she wasn't gonna make it through the, the day. Um, and I took her to that back room um, and it was just, you know, I just held her as she died, as she breathed her last breath. And um, the only solace I could take from that was that she was out of that cage. Nobody was going to steal her eggs anymore. Um, and she was so out of it, so she wasn't afraid I was holding her. Um, and she died, you know, warm with somebody who cared for her. Um, but I know it was, it was hard for everybody who you know, the weeks and days after. Day two, we drove back early in the morning, hopeful that we were gonna get more out because we had more room. I mean, we had barns and we were on the standby just in case, you know, we'll put something up, we'll, we'll make something. So we were handing them poultry crates through this opening and they were filling them with the healthy birds and then giving them back to us. And we only had 50 or so and so we were pulling them out of that and putting them into anything that we can carry them to the sanctuary with. Um, we ran out of crates so quickly like you know dog and cat crates. By the end we were using boxes. I had animals that were living stockpiled in trailers because I was so afraid that if I didn't keep on giving them crates that they were going to stop. They were going to say hey that's enough. And so as fast as we were handing them we were we were trying to find places for them and thankfully we had so many volunteers that came out and you don't know that there's such a we have such a community until it's needed and necessary and it was it was inspiring people that came they just heard about it and they came with their trailers and they came with their their vans and like animal control facilities that we had never really worked with closely we were coming out of the woodwork and saying hey we'll transport for you it was just amazing on that second day people just showing up like i had no idea who half of these people were and they were just there because they cared about chickens um, and that was incredible. This was such a huge, large-scale rescue that it was a community effort. And to think about how, how many people just, just came in from everywhere, you know, totally confused and, and, and not too many people who have ever been at a rescue before.
thing. I mean, you've got dead birds above you and dead birds below you, and you have you have waste. You have you have you know feces piled you know two feet deep, and and it's just just the most god awful way to imagine dying. I knew that if I would address like the guys that were doing the the uh, with the animal control folks, then I would then I would like fit into their crowd, and I knew that if I presented myself like them. They wouldn't see me as some kind of a rescuer, an outsider. And so it allowed me to go in and get those birds. But the funny thing was, is if I would have turned around and said, hey, we need help in here, I would have had 50 people run in that pit in their bare feet if they had to. And so those few birds in the waste pits were able to exemplify what it's like for all the chickens in that system. And I spent the next day not only doing animal care for the birds that I had just taken in, you know, which was close to a thousand, you know, um, but also trying to set up for, you know, the next load that was coming. I was drastically short supplies um, because, you know, who would have thought the day before that we'd be taking in, you know, thousands and thousands of animals. Every single barn on that 60 acre property was filled with birds but that wasn't enough so we also had to in the middle of the night go out to every feed store I think within 30 40 60 miles and buy every feeder water pin shaving straw chicken feed that they had we, we we bought out all the stores and then we also erected temporary structures out of welded wire so I'd be getting these calls throughout the day saying you know okay uh, We've got another 400 out, you know, and, and they're headed your way. Um, how many more do you think you can fit? Okay, we've got another 600 out, you know, and they're headed your way. How many more do you think you can fit? You know, all right, we've got another another 600 out, you know, like, and so we're starting to look in the magnitude of, of thousands, you know, there's 1,000, there's 2,000, 3,000. We were, we were running out of spaces, and I knew that at some point we had reached more than we could care for. The carrying capacity, me and Kim talked about as we were going in, was somewhere around 2,000. Uh, we reached that quota very early um, in the afternoon that second day. And I called Kim up, I remember this, and I said, Kim, you need to tell me to stop because I'm not gonna be able to stop. I will take them until they won't give them to me anymore. And, um, sorry. I can't say no, I can't not give them more crates. She said, Jamie, you do what your heart says. She says, we'll figure it out, we'll find a way. You don't worry about that, I'll worry about the money, I'll worry about the staffing. You just get them out, you get as many as you can out. I don't think anybody who was involved in this rescue wasn't touched very deeply by what we saw. I think I brought the last 500 or so, and that was all. They, they literally said there are no more healthy birds. I gave them, I kept on giving them crates until they said there aren't any more. We had so many wonderful volunteers that were on site and that followed us back to Rescue Ranch to help with all the triage that needed to happen. Because day two, they were that much sicker than day one. I mean, they were so weak that you had to set them next to food and you had to set them next to water. And you can't imagine the scope of 4,000 plus birds in barns. Like, there was a sea of white. It was an, an amazing sight there at Rescue Ranch, seeing how all those birds were in their individual groups and the care that the staff managed to give them throughout that intensive time, it's, it's, it's miraculous. We were all running on no sleep, you know, from the first night I went out there, slept a couple hours, you know, it, on the floor of a van. Um, you know, the second night we slept a couple hours between, you know, getting, uh, getting everybody sort of stabilized that we could, 
and then waking up the next morning to start again. And that third night was, was more of the same. You know, we just had more birds, you know, so our emergency room or triage center, whatever you want to call it, you know, got, you know, bigger. Um, we had more work to do. We had more animals that were, were dying and needed to be tube fed. We had more animals that needed, you know, fluids or antibiotics or whatever. Many hens died um, as soon as they got back and they started eating and their systems just shut down. We worked, you know, into the, into the night on, on shifts. And when I say on shifts, I mean that somebody would, you know, go and sleep from one in the morning to three in the morning and then come back out and relieve somebody who was in the process of, you know, administering these much needed medications and nutrition. And they'd allow them to go sleep for a couple hours. You know, it was hard, like we didn't have that many people. We needed a vet there and I think I like was extremely overwhelmed. And when I had finally like walked out, I realized I had been in there for nine hours and hadn't like actually left that act that room. And so you're you're trying to save these animals knowing that for most of them, it, no matter how much care you give and how much love you try to give them, they are still gonna die. They're, they're still not gonna make it. I had a grave dog there on the property at Rescue Ranch with a tractor. They dug me a trench that was six feet deep and about 20 feet long. And I thought, oh God, that's huge, you know? Like, I've got this huge hole in the ground now. Um, and, we, and we felled it, you know? We lost, you know, almost 400 birds throughout that rescue. I mean, I know we saved so many, but I think it was really sad that we we couldn't save them all because there were so many when it comes down to it. I, along with, with my coworkers here at Animal Place, I think all do this job because, you know, we want to save lives. And I don't know if any of us sort of imagined how real and visceral and close to death like that makes you. Our desire to to help these animals and, and save these lives makes you come face to face in the most disgusting, awful way with an enormous amount of death. And I, it was it was more than I was prepared for. You know, I didn't. I didn't know what to do, you know. But we always know, um, whether we take in one animal or we're taking in 4,000, is that we can't save them all. And some are just so badly damaged before we get them. You know, that the best you can do is give them um, a painless death. And that, that sounds horrible. Yeah, you know, it's the best you can do, but sometimes it is. So we knew when we took in those 4,000 plus that their, their, whole, their health had been so compromised that we were gonna have a fairly, a fairly high mortality. I, I, was, I was surprised, I was shocked that the mortality was as low as it was. So out of 50,000 birds, we're, res we're able to rescue almost 4,500 of them. That leaves over 45,000 birds in three days, four days, at this one facility that died suffering. You know, there's no other words for it. You know, they died in hell. They died starving to death. Even the ones that were, were gassed, you know, the ones that were killed by the state, even those still died suffering. It's comparable to war, you know? Like, when else do you lose 45,000 lives, you know, in one foul swoop, you know? that's. That's, that's war, you know, when else, do, when else do communities have to build, you know, mass graves for, for, you know, others that they care about that they've lost, you know, like, that's, uh, it's war. Um, and I don't know, you know, how else to put it besides, you know, the casualties of, of, you know, violence and massacre and, and a war against, you know, their very existence, you know, on a mass scale. The workload was immense. You know, we worked 14, 16 hour days every day of the week for months. You know, we were fortunate enough to have a large amount of volunteers that came out initially. It, our, our staff was just spread terribly thin between the two sanctuaries. 
just the volunteers who came out, there were so many of them and they stayed there for, you know, a good two, three weeks after that initial rescue. You know, we had four plus barns, you know, filled to maximum, maximum capacity with, with chickens. Day three and day four, they started to display their personalities. There'd be sun into the barns. They'd start sunbathing. They had never felt sun before, and it would just make you cry because it was the first time they were experiencing this. And I remember seeing on those first couple days them scratching and starting the dust bathe and being like, this is, oh wait, I know this innately. I've never had ground, I've never had dirt, but I know innately that I should be dust bathing, that this isn't gonna make me clean, that this is something that a chicken does. And to watch that slow progression of them being these automatons in a sense, like these, we make them into these like animals that are in a box. They don't act like chickens. They can't express their natural behaviors. And we take them out of that and they slowly, slowly become individuals. This is what we live for when they start becoming individuals. When you take them out of these horrible situations, neglect, cruelty, and you give them love, and you give them clean bedding, and you give them good food, and they slowly become these individuals that had always been hiding, that they were never allowed to express. They, they become who they were supposed to be all along. But I remember it was the first week or the second week, and there was a bowl of food um, and there was this chicken. I walked in on her and I'm like, what are you doing? She was dust bathing in a bowl full of food. And I remember thinking to myself, I called everyone over. I was like, you're not gonna believe what I see right now. There is a chicken dust bathing in food. And there'd be these like looks of like, okay, well they've been dust bathing for a lot. I'm like, but do you don't get it. They've been without food for so long. She's dust bathing in food. This is like the epitome of like what a sanctuary should be. They should just dust bathe in food all day because they deserve it. So I remember this one barn, it was a big red barn. And this is the first time the hens in that barn were gonna get to go outside. And so I planted myself outside the door because I thought it was gonna be this like dramatic moment of these hens. They would see the outside and they would just all run and they would flap their wings and they would be chickens again. Um, and it's like how easily I forgot that these hens just a few days ago were in a cage and they had no concept of grass or dirt. Um, they had never been able to pick up pebbles or to flap their wings and, and these were things that were just totally foreign to these hens and so the door opened and I had my, my camera ready and they just stood there and they were staring outside and, and I could t see them like processing all this information that they were getting um, but they wouldn't move and I sat there for, for 20 minutes until finally this one brown hen she stood at the edge of the barn that separated her from inside and outside, and, and she was taking it all in, and then she took that first step. And that's the first time she's ever touched dirt and grass before. And you could just see her like, oh, what a strange feeling this is. Um, she, was, she was experiencing something new for the first time, and it was kind of exciting for her. And then once the other hen saw her take that first step, everybody ran out, everybody started to scratch in the dirt, and they had never experienced that before. To be able to just affect the life of one individual in a positive way is something that's really, really profound. And I can still feel that, you know. Fortunately, the public really stepped up to the plate. Not only did they come out to volunteer week after week and month after month, but they made donations to Animal Place. They recognized that this was going to be a very expensive um, rescue for the sanctuary, and they helped. And it was wonderful to see people stand up for chickens. I mean, it's usually kind of the companion animals that uh, people are mostly concerned about. Farm animals, less so, unfortunately. In an ideal world, it would be incredible for groups like Animal Place to be able to take in 4,000 hens at, at our sanctuary. Um, but the reality is we have limited space and limited staff, so we had to do something different. Um, we had to reach out to the community and invite them to be a part of this rescue as well in an adoption process. Um, so most of the hens we rescued 
we were placed into permanent loving homes. Um, all these adopters go through the same screening process that people who want to adopt dogs or cats go through. There's a telephone interview, there's site inspections. Everyone who adopts any of our animals has to sign a contract and it's pretty standard. There's just a few questions on it and a few things they have to agree to, like not selling the animal, not eating the animal, um, not using for any kind of commercial purpose and just agreeing to take care of them and provide veterinary care and food and water and the basic love that you should provide to your pet. There were so many people who wanted to be a part of this rescue um, because they had seen the video showing how awful their lives had been and they wanted to be that person to give them a great permanent life you know in their home. We had people applying in other states across the country like in Maine and Virginia, Georgia, Texas, everywhere. Everyone wanted these birds. I really don't think anybody who's been a part of this rescue has been untouched by, by these hens. Um, and not just their story, but, but who they are. Um, they have been through so much, and each and every one of them has handled their experience differently. I love them. <laughs> In fact, my husband said, he said, if I had known how much joy chickens would have brought to you, we would have had them a lot sooner. They were a surprise to me. I really didn't know what to expect in terms of their, their personalities and so forth, but uh, it's been fun to, to, to watch them because they're, uh, they're all different. They're like little people. You know, each of them has a different personality, each of them reacts differently, and they, they behave differently, and so they, you, you grow accustomed to it. I adopted nine hens altogether, the turlock hens. I really wanted to do something to help. Everything was so new to me about chickens, just the revelation about how chickens were so much like a cat or a dog, you know, just like a pet. They're cheerful, naturally cheerful creatures. They seem to have forgotten the past and they live in the present moment. They're just a total delight all the time. I name them and later I give them a nickname to sort of fit their personality. Uh, Lucy um, was Lucy, but I call her Lulu because she's always in and out of trouble. <laughs> I remember taking my first hand to the doctor and thinking, how can I justify eating meat, spending 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 dollars, it gets very expensive, on a hen, and then going and buying chicken at the store. It just is so, it's um, uh, schizophrenic in a way. My thinking is, there's something wrong here. I could just, it's just, and then the more I got to know the chickens, so then I said, well, I can't eat chicken. Then I can't, well, I thought, well, what's the difference between pigs and chickens? And I started to see more and more. A lot of it had to do with the internet and being able to see videos. You know, the stuff that they don't advertise on TV that you can see on the internet. And then the interaction with the chickens themselves, connecting, looking at each other in the eyes, hearing them scream if they're scared. Oh my God, these animals are like me. These are like, and it, and it began to dawn on me. It, it almost became overwhelming at a moment. You could see a person going, I refuse to see it because it, it puts too much guilt on me. If then Now I'm guilty for all my sins of my past. How can I bear the burden of that kind of guilt? How can I do it? And then I looked at the animals and I thought, how can I not do it? What, it's, it's like I'm more worried about my ego being bruised than I am about their actual lives. And, and then I thought, there's just so much selfishness in that thinking. There's so much... And it, it just, it, it just gradually, it just, it's like a big, strong, gradual wave that rolled over me to the point of veganism. 
it's still like I have to try to grasp it, think about it hard. These chickens that I love were in those cages and each one of them has an individual personality. They're, they are so unique. I mean, I just, I, I think of all the unique personalities lost, all of the, it's, it's so overwhelming. I, I don't even know. The only thing that keeps me going is that other people are working on it too, you know? Uh, so most of the hens we rescued from this battery cage operation are called white leghorns. They're little white, tiny little birds. Um, and they're the most common breed used in the egg laying industry. And these hens, along with the other kind of high production egg laying breeds, have been artificially selected to lay three to five times more eggs than they should. Um, they lay up to 300 to 320 eggs a year. Uh, I compare that to some of the lovely hens we have at the sanctuary who we rescued from you know, hoarding cases and their tiny little feral birds, and they lay about 20 to 40 eggs a year. Um, so the side effects of, of that high production, they have enormous rates of ovarian cancer. Um, they have very brittle bones because all their calcium is just being leached into making the shell on that egg. Um, eggs get stuck inside their bodies because their bodies just, they just give up. They just can't handle all this egg production. You know, we have this really amazing rescue and we've liberated these hens from this awful situation, but really they're just prisoners in their own bodies. Normal chickens lay somewhere around like 30 eggs a year, clutches that they do to raise babies. It's, they don't make eggs so we can eat them. They make eggs so they can raise their young. The conditions under which uh, these birds lived and how they were treated, um, people often ask me, is that the worst you've seen? And no, no. I, I think when it comes not just to birds raised for their eggs, but birds raised for their flesh, as I saw in Katrina, um, pigs raised for their meat, cows raised for their milk. Um, no, the Turlock hens, it, it wasn't the worst side I've seen. I, I wish it was. I wish I could say that represents the worst of farming of animals, and it doesn't. A lot of people ask about cage-free and free-range farms and if it's okay to eat those eggs. Um, it's important for people to realize that behind every single egg, 150 million male chicks are killed every year. Male chicks don't produce eggs. They don't grow at the rate that broiler or meat type chickens grow. They're trash to the, to the chicken industry and it doesn't matter what kind of farm you buy eggs from, male chicks are always killed. And they're killed by being ground up alive or by being suffocated or gassed to death by the millions. And it's awful. And on most cage-free farms, hens um, still have a portion of their beaks cut off and this is done without pain relief. Uh, chickens have very nerve rich and blood vessel rich beaks. They're very sensitive. So when you cut them off, it's incredibly painful and it leaves them with a lifelong uh, deformity that they have a hard time cleaning themselves and eating. And that happens on cage free farms and it happens on big free range farms. Um, and at the end of the day, all of those hens are killed. There is not an egg farm that keeps all the male chicks and offers them sanctuary and a, a happy bucolic egg farm where all the hens live out their lives. Once that egg production goes down a little bit and it's not profitable to feed them, they are all sent to slaughter. There's no such thing as a free range slaughterhouse. There's no such thing as a free range processing facility. All these animals reach an age, you know, chickens. If they're, they're chickens for meat, you know, 42 days. If they're hens, 18 months, you know. If they're cows, you know, 20 months or 1,300 pounds, you know, whichever comes first. You know, pigs, six months. All these animals reach an age that's a fraction of their natural lifespan. And at that point, they're taken from whatever happy little farm they grew up on or whatever dismal factory farm that they, you know, were grown in. And they're all sent to the exact same processing facilities, the exact same slaughterhouses, and they're murdered in the exact same way. So there's, there's nothing friendly or compassionate or humane about violently ending another being's life. And there's no way to honestly, honestly face that and, and still continue to use terms like humane meat, humane eggs, humane dairy.
There are 10 billion animals who are killed for consumption every year, and 200 million of them are chickens from the egg industry. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, every time we, we make a, a choice at the supermarket, we can make a choice for compassion, or we can choose to be a part of the system that cruelly treats billions of sentient beings every year. You know, Animal Place has been around for almost 25 years now, and during our, our history, we've, we've done a lot of large-scale rescues. But th the, this, this one rescue in Turlock, I mean, we saved over 4,000 lives. That's the largest rescue we have ever done. Um, I, I don't know if ever that opportunity will be there again when you can take so many lives out of just hellish, horrendous conditions um, and care for them and then find forever homes. So this was a huge rescue for the state of California. It was a huge rescue for, for farmed animals in the United States and it was a huge undertaking for Animal Place. The Turlock Rescue was the largest rescue of farm animals in California history. And we were part of that. Animal Place spearheaded that. I'm so unbelievably proud of the staff and the volunteers that helped make it possible. It changed my life in a few ways. I watched it change adopters' lives, uh, my friends' and family's lives, coworkers' lives, and of course the chickens' lives. You know, we were able to rescue like thousands of individuals, and that's something that, you know, in my wildest, you know, animal rights fantasies didn't ever, you know, anticipate happening. I feel so grateful to have been part of this monumental effort to save so many hens. It's changed my life and, and I hope that it changes others to make more compassionate decisions. You know, people were outraged by the Turlock situation. People are outraged when they hear how farmed animals are raised. But what they don't know is that they're contributing to that. And the best way to help the animals is just simply stop eating them. Stop eating their flesh, stop eating their eggs, stop drinking their milk, just to adopt a plant-based, a, a vegan diet.